Hi, everybody. It's Tom Woods, and today we're going to continue our discussion of liberalism. And this time we're going to talk about one person in particular, a man named Frederick Bastiat. First, let's review what we covered last time. Last time I introduced to you the idea of liberalism, but of course, remember, we're talking about classical liberalism. And by classical liberalism, I'm talking about a school of thought that really comes into its own and develops in the 18th and 19th centuries, but we can see precursors certainly in the 17th century in the form of the Levelers and John Locke. The liberals believe in freedom, and that means they believe in the freedom of speech, freedom of the press, a free market economy, where the government's interference in the economy is kept to an absolute minimum. They believe in religious liberty, having seen the various cruelties and the forms of inhumanity that have existed in terms of the way people have treated members of other religions, well, they've decided to stop doing that, that societies should not establish governments that punish people for belonging to the wrong religion. So instead, they favor a, a regime of religious liberty. Also central to the liberal program is private property, and I went through various reasons that private property would be viewed as an essential attribute of a free society. So we went through and looked at a number of these basic ideas. They think of society as something that more or less runs itself. It doesn't need a lot of government involvement, and we'll see that there's even a wing of classical liberals who will say it needs no government involvement whatsoever. We went through and looked at a number of the key figures in the development of liberalism in the United States, uh, the Jeffersonians, and in uh, Britain we looked at uh, Cobden and Bright and the Anti-Corn Law League. I mentioned that we'll be getting to Spencer in a later lesson. We talked about uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt. A lot of these names I just want you to be familiar with. So the, the classical liberals believe, by and large, in limited government, a government that is limited to the protection of life, liberty, and property. That's what government is there for. It's to make sure that you have a functioning legal system so that you can sue in the courts if you are wronged, that you have a police force that can keep you safe from domestic criminals and a military to keep you safe from overseas criminals. That's it. That's what, that's what the liberal generally wants. Now, some of them will want some more things, and some of them want government education. Uh, it's kind of an odd position to take, to be a liberal and say, we can't trust government at all except on the most important thing there is. But you will see some making that type of exception. But generally, they favor limited government and a free market economy. Now, a number of the themes that I just raised here in reviewing the previous lesson are going to be illustrated vividly in the work of the person whose who's, uh, writing we're going to examine today, and that's Frederick Bastiat. Frederick Bastiat was a writer from 18, in France from 1801 to 1850. Those are the years of his life. Uh, not a long life, but an exceptionally productive and influential one. Now, Bastiat would not be the sort of person whose work would get a whole lot of attention in a traditional Western civilization course, but that's because traditional Western civilization courses stink. Uh, frankly, they are not interested in, in conveying the ideas that were current at that time. Uh, they, I mean, you know, they'll give you some sense of, of what liberalism was all about, but you won't find a professor who really wants to acquaint you with Bastiat, because a lot of professors have never even heard of Bastiat, and if they have, they don't want you knowing about it. I mean, it really is grotesque. I've observed this from the inside, having been involved in academia for many years, that you have students studying people whose work is so vastly inferior to Bastiat's, but those people said things that the professors liked, so that's what you wind up studying. Well, we're going to try to level the playing field here and make sure that you are exposed to the work of Frederick Bastiat. I've chosen four works by Bastiat, to comment on for you in this particular lesson. And I'm going to begin with an essay he wrote called The Motive Force of Society. And for this one, not for the others, but for this one, I'm going to read to you some somewhat lengthy passages just to illustrate for you what his point is. And by the way, when I'm reading, 
if you're having a little trouble grasping his meaning, uh, don't worry, I will give you my commentary and explanation when I finish. The Motive Force of Society is an essay that looks at the question that's right here on the slide. Does society emerge from the self-directed behavior of individuals or from lawmakers imposing blueprints on society? Well, I suppose if, if you've understood what liberalism is all about, you can see where a liberal is going to come down on this one. Uh, obviously, society emerges from the self-directed behavior of individuals. And it is the opposite of the liberal message to think that society is created by the blueprints of statesmen who come up with these brilliant ideas in their brains and then they're going to write out some blueprints and they're going to force us all into a certain mold and that that's how society emerges. Uh, no, no, that's, uh, that's how despotism, that's how tyranny emerges. Let me share for you some passages from this particular essay by Bastia. He says, Rousseau, referring to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the political thinker, Rousseau was, I believe, the political theorist who most naively exhumed from antiquity this idea, which had already been resurrected by the Greeks, of the omnipotence of the lawgiver. Convinced that the social order is a human invention, he compares it to a machine. Men are the cogs, the prince makes it run. The lawgiver invents it at the bidding of the political theorist, who thus, in the last analysis, activates and controls the human race. That is why the political theorist never fails to address the lawgiver in the imperative mood. He orders him to give the orders. Establish your nation on such and such a principle. Give it good manners and customs. Make it bow to the authority of religion. Orient it toward war or commerce or agriculture or virtue, etc., etc., the more modest among them hide behind the anonymity of the passive voice. Idlers will not be tolerated in the Republic. The population will be suitably distributed between the cities and the country. Steps will be taken so that there will be neither rich nor poor, etc., etc. So what he's saying here is that Rousseau had this, very much had this view of the lawmaker as the creator of society and you are just a piece of clay, and he's going to mold you as necessary to make you fit into the society that he has created. This is the way the, uh, the opposite of liberalism would approach the idea of society and social order. And as you can clearly hear from Bastiat in this passage, he says that the political theorist, the one who sits there in his armchair thinking up how he thinks society should be, how he thinks society should be arranged and organized, well, he then turns to the politician and the lawgiver and tells him, you should do this. Force your society into this mold. Make it do this. Make it do that. Orient it in this direction. Or make sure you have this many people in the cities and this many people in the countryside. And make sure you have this many rich people and this many poor people. Well, this is, uh, you know, this is not something that a liberal is going to sympathize with at all. A liberal would say, let society unfold and flourish on its own without being bossed around by some kind of director, some kind of lawgiver with a bullhorn making commands to everybody. No, just see how many rich, how many poor you wind up with through the functioning of a free market economy. That gives you the wealthiest society you can have, and then just see where it goes. See how many people want to live in the countryside. <laughs> see how many people want to live in the cities. Don't force them. Just see what happens through the spontaneous, purely self-directed activity of free individuals. That would be the liberal response to all this. Let me continue with Bastiat. He says that implicit in the kinds of ideas we've just been looking at is a conception of man that leaves the human race not one shred of self-respect. Well, that is obviously true because it suggests that the human race can't function at all until the, the wise lawgiver comes around and starts bossing everybody around. He says, it gives rise to the view that the social economy is an artificial arrangement that has sprung from the brain of an inventor. Every political theorist, therefore, constitutes himself an inventor forthwith. Bastiat goes on to say, 
In practice, the doctrine that places the motive force of society not in all mankind and in the nature of man, but in lawgivers and in governments, tends to weigh down the government with a crushing responsibility that does not belong to it. If there is suffering, it is the fault of the government. If there is poverty, the government is to blame. For is not the government the universal motive force? If this motive force is not good, we must destroy it and choose another. When such ideas are current, the last thing that occurs to men is to turn their gaze upon themselves and to see whether the real cause of their woes is not their own ignorance and injustice. How could men dream of blaming themselves for their woes when they have been persuaded that by nature they are inert, that the source of all action and consequently of all responsibility lies outside themselves in the will of the sovereign and of the lawgiver? So again, here, I mean, this should be, should be pretty obvious what he's saying here, is that as soon as you tell people that the real driving force of society is not human beings themselves making their own decisions and propelling their own lives forward, but the real motive force of society is government and its lawgivers, well, people are going to say, well, if the real driving force of society is government and lawgivers, then whenever bad things happen to me, it must be because of we, we need better government and lawgivers. And I better turn to them for guidance in my life. I better turn to them to do what needs to be done for me. And Bastiat says, notice that it never occurs to people to say, wait a minute, maybe it's my own fault. Maybe, it, it could be that I'm to blame for my situation. As soon as you say, no, the driving force of society isn't individuals pursuing their own plans and purposes, but the driving force is lawgivers and governments, then everybody's going to look to government to solve all their problems. Bastiat says that people who think this way, and I'm quoting him again, do not want natural society. What they do want is an artificial society, which has come forth full grown from the brain of its inventor. What they have in common is their refusal to recognize in mankind either the motive force that impels men toward the good or the self-healing power that delivers them from evil. They quarrel over who will mold the human clay, but they agree that there is human clay to mold. Mankind is not in their eyes a living and harmonious being endowed by God himself with the power to, pro to progress and to survive, but an inert mass that has been waiting for them to give it feeling and life. Human nature, for them, is not a subject to be studied, but matter on which to perform experiments. Well, that is what the liberal is up against, against the social planners, the government planners, who think of mankind not as something to be studied to understand it better, but as something to be molded and planned and directed by somebody who's in charge. This is the opposite of the liberal view of society, which is that society can more or less manage its affairs spontaneously without the outside violent interference of a government, interf uh, a government official. Of course, every, every one of his actions is violence or the threat of violence. Uh, when a government official tells you what to do or how to order your life, there's always a gun behind it, because if you don't do it, he can force you to go to jail. So it, it always is at least implicitly violent. And Basiat denies that that is necessary for the good functioning of society. Let's look now at a very famous satirical work by Bastiat, The Petition of the Candlemakers. And this is meant to be preposterous. Okay, so you're not supposed to take this seriously. It's meant to be ridiculous. The candlemakers in this petition are writing to the government and saying, you need to do something about the unfair competition we have to deal with. We're trying to provide lighting services and lighting products, like you know, candles, to the general public, and we're being stymied in this because somebody out there is competing with us unfairly. They refuse to compete fairly. And who is this unfair competitor? Why, the sun. How can we compete with the sun? in selling candles. We sell candles. How can we compete with the sun? Candles give off light, but you have to pay for our candles. The sun is giving light off all day long for free. 
How can we compete with a price of zero? The sun gives away its services at a price of zero. How can we compete with that? How can we endure this ruinous competition from the sun? So therefore, we call upon the government to force people to block the sunlight from their homes, shutter up their windows. Then they'll need to buy more candles. And when they buy more candles, well, then we candle makers will have more money to spend with other people, and it'll make everybody rich if you force people to pay for something they could normally get for free. Well, if that sounds ridiculous to you, that's the point. It's supposed to sound ridiculous. You don't become rich by artificially depriving yourself of something that you would normally get for free and then forcing yourself to pay for it. What he's doing here is attacking the fallacies of protectionism. Protectionism is the school of thought that says that domestic producers should be shielded from foreign competition through tariffs. A tariff is a tax on imported goods. And the thinking behind protectionism is, well, you can't expect us to compete with these other countries that produce goods much more cheaply. Everybody will just buy from these other countries. So we got to stop them from buying from these other countries. We have to, Im we have to interfere with their, freedom to, to, with their freedom to buy whatever they want from anybody they want. We've got to interfere with that freedom so that we can compete. And the way we're going to compete is basically just cutting off our competition, imposing such heavy taxes on imported goods that nobody will buy the imported goods. They'll be forced to buy from us, and so we can get away for selling our goods more expensively than we could otherwise because now our competition has been hobbled by the tariffs. Well, what Bastiat is going to say is that, well, if you're telling me that it makes sense for us to interfere with people's liberty to buy what they want from wherever they want because your competitor, let's say, can sell products 50% cheaper than you can, well then, it seems to me that by the same logic, wouldn't it make even more sense to block a competitor that can sell 100% cheaper than you can, namely the sun? The sun can sell 100% cheaper than a candle maker because the sun gives off its light for free. So if the arguments of the protectionists are correct, that, oh my gosh, our competitors in such and such country, they can sell widgets for 70% less than we can sell them. So let's put a 200% tax on their widgets so that we can carry on as before. Well, if that makes sense, then it makes even more sense to say, hey, the sun can produce 100% cheaper than we can, so let's block out the sun. Let's block out that competitor. Bastiat will say in both cases, we are turning away a gift that's coming to us. In this case, something that we can get for free, and we're turning this away. Well, likewise, if we can get some product for 70% cheaper somewhere else, that's a gift. That's a gift as much as sunlight is a gift. If we're going to reject that gift, we should reject the gift of sunlight. So he's defending the free market economy, which is a central ingredient of liberalism, as is free trade itself through the means of this satirical work, The Petition of the Candlemakers. Another famous Bastiat essay is called What is Seen and What is Not Seen. Here he invites us to understand what the real consequences of government involvement in the economy are. And as Henry Hazlitt said in his book Economics in One Lesson in the 20th century, that book is really just an extended meditation on this essay by Bastiat, uh, Hazlitt said, if you want to think like an economist, you have to think in this way. You have to think not just, let's look at this government program and let's see what the immediate effects of it are on one group. An economist asks himself, what are not just the immediate effects, what are the long-term effects, and not just what are the effects on one targeted group, what are the effects on everybody? So, for example, classic case would be the government takes people's money and builds a bridge. And then afterward, it says, hey, everybody, look at this bridge we built. Isn't the government great? But what Bastiat is going to say is, you need to be intelligent enough to evaluate this. You need to be intelligent enough to be able to see beyond what you can see with your physical eyes. You need to be able to see also with your mind's eye. You need to ask yourself, what would have been built 
if the government hadn't taken everybody's money to build this bridge. Something else would have been built. People would have been employed doing something other than bridge building. We say, hey, look at this bridge. Look at the people employed to build this bridge. What we don't say is, well, where would those people have been employed if all these resources, and all this money hadn't been sucked out of people's pockets? Well, they would have been producing other things. So what we see is the bridge. And people of limited intelligence can see only that. But what you who are brighter can also see in your mind's eye is the thing that is not physically seen which is what might have been built with that money what employment might those people have had had they not been diverted to a project that the general public did not voluntarily choose to spend its money on namely the bridge so there is something else that we do not see we have all these things that might have been produced that never get produced we have all these, these uh, investments that don't get made because the money to make them has now been diverted to a bridge project that could very well just be politically motivated. The, the politicians want the bridge there because they live over there or a lot of their voters live over there, not because it really makes any economic sense. So every time government spends money, there is what is seen and what is not seen. If there's what the government produces with the money, yes, but what might have been done? What ways that our, might our lives have been improved without the government doing this? We tend to lose sight of that, and we shouldn't. Certainly a liberal needs to understand that the free market economy is always producing things that we would want, but it produces fewer of those things when government takes the money away, no matter what the government winds up spending that money on. Finally, perhaps the best-known work of Bastiat is this little book called The Law. And I will give you just a, a the real gist of this book, but there's, there's so much more in this, this beautiful little book. Bastiat says, what is the law? He says, the law is the organization of the natural right to lawful defense. What he means by that is that you have a right to defend yourself and your property from people who would take those things from you. The law is an organized way of doing this, an organized way of protecting your natural right to defend those things. So the law then is the formal way that we arrange to make sure that our stuff is protected and our lives are protected. But Bastiat says that over time the law becomes perverted. He says people want to live and prosper at others expense when possible. People want to people want to get what they want with the least effort. That's just part of human nature. And if they can get what they want by taking it from other people and getting away with it, they'll do it. And so the key passage, to my mind, begins uh, in this book, begins right here. He says, Man can live and satisfy his wants only by ceaseless labor, by the ceaseless application of his faculties to natural resources. This process is the origin of property. But it is also true that a man may live and satisfy his wants by seizing and consuming the products of the labor of others. This process is the origin of plunder. Now, since man is naturally inclined to avoid pain, and since labor is pain in itself, it follows that men will resort to plunder whenever plunder is easier than works. So in other words, whenever it's easier to just grab other people's things, than it is to work honestly to get things, people will just grab other people's things. And he says, it is evident then that the proper purpose of law is to use the power of its collective force to stop this fatal tendency to plunder instead of to work. All the measures of the law should protect property and punish plunder. So that's what law is supposed to do. It's supposed to protect you, and it's supposed to discourage people from trying to get ahead by just taking people's things. But the law gets perverted, Bastiat says. The law gets perverted. The law winds up eventually doing the opposite. The law begins encouraging plunder. He calls it legal plunder. Yes, it's true. The law protects you from your next-door neighbor coming over to your house and taking your things. But the law eventually comes to encourage the idea that although your next door neighbor can't come over and take your things, what your next door neighbor can do is vote for somebody 
who raises your taxes and then takes your tax money and gives it to your neighbor. So your neighbor can't just come and take your money. Yeah, the law will punish him. But the law will allow the government to come take your money and hand it to your friend. The law will allow the farmers to come take your money and subsidize the farmers or the industrialists to come and, and, and subsidize the industrialists. Now, again, the farmer himself can't knock on your door and take your stuff. That would be illegal plunder. What he can do is vote for a politician who comes and does the same, the same thing. And that's called legal plunder. And so Bastiat is going to say this is a perversion of the law. And it destroys society. Because before you know it, everybody's going to want to do this. If you're being plundered to benefit some group, then you're going to decide you better plunder somebody else to benefit your group. And before you know it, society is fighting a war with each other, everybody trying to grab hold of the government to make sure that the government benefits them, I imposes plunder that benefits their own group. Here's Bastiat from the law. He says, how is this legal plunder to be identified? Quite simply, see if the law takes from some persons what belongs to them and gives it to other persons to whom it does not belong. See if the law benefits one citizen at the expense of another by doing what the citizen himself cannot do without committing a crime. In other words, your neighbor cannot go to your house and take your stuff because he would be viewed as committing a crime. But if the law can benefit the citizen in that same way, if the government can come take your money and give it to him, and the government is not viewed as committing a crime, that's legal plunder. He says, abolish this law without delay, for it is not only an evil in itself, but also it is a fertile source for further evils because, as I said before, it invites reprisals. If such a law is not abolished immediately, it will spread, multiply, and develop into a system as everybody tries to loot and plunder everybody else. And he says that meanwhile, socialist politicians, politicians who believe in redistributing wealth from one person to another, taking it from some and giving it to another, they believe in legal plunder. They're encouraging this. Th this is their preferred system. They want a system in which government directs whose money should go where and who, which group should get how much money from whom. The socialists encourage this. They favor this. The socialists look at society, according to Bastiat, as something, as a, as something that should be created by their own blueprint, as something that needs to be directed, needs to be ordered around, needs to be forced to fit the patterns in the minds of the socialist politicians. So legal plunder is exactly how the socialist society is brought about, by governments just taking from some and giving to politically privileged groups. Let me read to you just a couple of brief uh, further passages from the law elaborating on this point. He says, These socialist writers look upon people in the same manner that the gardener views his trees. Just as the gardener capriciously shapes the trees into pyramids, parasols, cubes, vases, fans, and other forms, just so does the socialist writer whimsically shape human beings into groups, series, centers, subcenters, honeycombs, labor corps, and other variations. And just as the gardener needs axes, pruning hooks, saws, and shears to shape his trees, just so does the socialist writer need the force that he can find only in law to shape human beings. For this purpose, he devises tariff laws, tax laws, relief laws, and school laws. So he implements this idea of legal plunder because that's what his own political philosophy is all about. And then finally, this passage. According, he, in this passage, he's going to say that the socialist writers believe that government officials are full of wonderful, noble, good intentions, whereas people in the general run of society are all wicked and inert and they need to be, they need to be directed by the force of law. Now, of course, you wonder, how do the government officials, how are they exempt from this general rule that the general run of mankind is helpless without direction and probably wicked without being directed by the government official how come the government official isn't wicked like how is he exempt from this general characteristic of the human race we never get that question answered 
He says, according to these writers, it is indeed fortunate that heaven has bestowed upon certain men, governors and legislators, the exact opposite inclinations, not only for their own sake, but also for the sake of the rest of the world. While mankind, they say, tends toward evil, the legislators yearn for good. While mankind advances toward darkness, the legislators aspire for enlightenment. While mankind is drawn toward vice, the legislators are attracted toward virtue. Since they have decided that this is the true state of affairs, they then demand the use of force in order to substitute their own inclinations for those of the human race. So again, the idea that government officials are superior to the rest of mankind and they ought to direct the human race, which needs to be directed and ordered about through men uh, using bullhorns to command them what to do. So that's a brief overview of some of the ideas of Frederick Bastiat. He is contemptuous of the ideas of those who would use government to form society and remake human nature. No, leave people alone to lead their lives, and the results will be best from the point of view of liberty, society, culture, and prosperity. Thanks for watching.